Zelda has its fair share of memorable adventures, each one having their own style of storytelling and gameplay. Ocarina of Time is an adventure about losing childhood and the danger of growing up too fast, while its sequel, Majora's Mask, is a take on the dark reality of dealing with adult trauma at a young age, an attempt to regain the childhood years you lost. It's quite remarkable how seamlessly each game changes tone. Each entry to the series is about taking on an adventure far greater than yourself, having the courage to pull through even if your enemies may be stronger. How each game presents its themes and ideas affects the overall experience, but there's one game among the sea of action adventures that takes a more laid-back approach. Instead of having the world's fate in your hands, you're on a quest to save someone close to you, to risk death on a perilous journey with no guaranteed return, a personal journey of self-growth and discovery. You are no longer sacrificing those you love in order to save the world, you're sacrificing the world to save those you love. I am of course talking about Phantom Hourglass. Yes, Phantom Hourglass, the sequel to Wind Waker that got buried under the releases of other titles. To this day, if you mention this game to a Zelda fan, their response is likely, oh yeah, that game, or wait, there's a sequel to Wind Waker? This game isn't really talked about, and when it is, people tend to only mention its flaws. It seems very strange that this game specifically is the one to be overshadowed. Could it be that it's universally hated by fans? Well, Zelda 2 and Skyward Sword are hated by most fans, but they're still talked about. There are plenty of videos either defending or criticising these two games, and discussing where they stand compared to the other titles. Could it be that handheld Zelda games just aren't that popular? I don't think that's the case either. Link's Awakening and Minish Cap are both handheld, and they're some of the most beloved entries in the series. So why is this game often not talked about? Is the mediocre reputation deserved, or is it a hidden gem? Well if you've read the title, you know where I stand on the statement, and yes, I do think that the game is not only underrated, but one of the better games in the series. Before I really deep dive into my reasons for defending this game, let me just get one thing out of the way. This was the first Zelda game that I played, so there may be some personal bias as to why I like it so much. However, while I am nostalgic for the game, it's most certainly not my favourite, and it isn't the game that got me hooked on the series. That game would be Twilight Princess. I can definitely see Phantom Hourglass's flaws, and why it doesn't work for some people, but I still want to give the game a fair chance. During the video, I may make some comparisons to Wind Waker, but this isn't a versus situation. If these two games were in a competition, Wind Waker would win, hands down. <coughs> It's also unfair to compare the two, as they're both trying to do different things. Like Ocarina and Majora, they can stand as their own games without the other's influence. There are some elements I think Phantom Hourglass did better than Wind Waker, but we'll get to those later. I want to discuss why these two games are both great in their own ways, and why we shouldn't overlook the seemingly smaller title. Here's why Phantom Hourglass is an underrated gem. Gameplay is one of the elements of Phantom Hourglass that really makes or breaks the experience for most people. Firstly, it's a very strange decision on Nintendo's part to make a direct sequel to Wind Waker on another console, with touchscreen controls and a top-down view perspective. Putting the two games side by side, they play completely differently from one another, even the visuals look compressed and outdated. The footage I'm showing is from an emulator, but this is how the game looks packaged. It's clear that the DS Lite can't quite handle Wind Waker's iconic cell shaded look. Secondly, even if this game was a standalone entry, the controls can definitely be inaccessible to some people. To move your character, you have to tap the stylus in the direction you want to go. Sword play in combat is also similar with you having to swipe on the screen to swing your sword. 
This mechanic is a little difficult to get used to and can easily make your hand cramp if you don't have an extended stylus. I get the feeling that Nintendo really wanted to push the capabilities of what the DS could achieve. This is further indicated by the amount of times the game makes you draw a symbol on the screen or shout into the microphone in order to make progress. When you have to draw on the screen, the stroke order has to be exactly correct or the game won't register it. But the game also doesn't tell you what the stroke order is and expects you to know which way the symbol is drawn. This was particularly frustrating during the final boss where you have to draw an hourglass to pause time. I got hit so many times because the game simply wasn't registering that I was drawing the symbol. As for the segments where you have to shout into the microphone, though they don't occur often, it makes the game a little awkward to play at times. As a selectively mute autistic kid, when a game told me to shout, I would take that literally and assume it meant I had to speak, which is very stressful for me at the time. Selective mutism still affects me to this day, so I still dread these sections whenever I start a new playthrough. The voice you're hearing that's narrating this video, that's not my voice. This is my brother reading off the script I wrote, so special thanks to James, or I guess, to myself? Accessibility is very important when it comes to gaming, and Nintendo consistently makes their games inaccessible, even if unintentionally. This is because they tend to make their core gameplay mechanics involve motion controls. In Phantom Hourglass's case, you can complete these sections by simply blowing into the microphone instead of shouting, which also makes it easier to play these sections in public though that decision doesn't seem like it's intentional by the developers. I wish there was an option to either make a noise or draw a symbol instead of making it seem like the only option is to talk. It can make the audience feel like you're excluded at times, even if unintentionally. This part of the game also feels unnecessary, you can take it out and not lose anything. Is it really necessary to make the player shout louder in order to lower the price of the cannon? Really? These are minor criticisms, but the mechanics can turn some players away, and understandably so. It's not for everybody. I actually think that some of the best parts of the game are DS exclusive. Some people have issues with the fact that you have to draw a path for your boat to move, rather than controlling it directly like Wind Waker. I'll be honest, I found Wind Waker's sailing, while fun, got repetitive after a while. Constantly changing the direction of the wind got annoying when all I wanted to do was make a small turn and I had to watch this cutscene again. Phantom Hourglass's sailing is a little more restrictive, but it's not like the player has nothing to do while the ship moves. There's tons of side quests to unlock, enemies to fight, and obstacles to avoid while sailing. The grappling hook is a returning item from Wind Waker, but in Phantom Hourglass it controls completely differently. Instead of it only being used to swing to other platforms and steal items from enemies, it can now be used to create tightropes and catapults which lead to some very fun puzzles. Using the boomerang is more fun than it's ever been, now the player can draw specific paths for it to follow. As a kid, I just endlessly draw pictures and watch the boomerang follow the shape I made. It was oddly satisfying. Another thing that's satisfying? The hammer! Yes, it's incredibly OP but it just feels amazing to crush enemies from the other side of the area just by tapping the screen. There are also some puzzles that involve smashing a button to launch yourself to other platforms. Eox is an incredibly fun fight because it uses the hammer to its fullest extent, which is something I wish Wind Waker did. The Helmer Rock King was a good boss fight thematically, and it is satisfying to crush his face with a hammer, but overall, the boss has a lot of waiting around, Eox, on the other hand, has no waiting around in its fight. The game throws you straight into battle with your only motive being to destroy this thing piece by piece, and it works wonders. The boss fights in Phantom Hourglass as a whole are really great, and there's a lot of reasons as to why they're so great. Some of them are because of the DS mechanics. Take the third boss for example. Cryak? Give me a minute. Craig. Uh, I'm just going to call him Craig. It's a boss that's invisible to the player on the bottom screen, but on the top screen you can see the boss's perspective and know where to shoot. That's wildly creative. Blaz makes you look on the top screen to determine which order you need to hit the boss in. Dongorongo, another hard name to pronounce, has you play as a Goron to knock out the boss on its side. 
Bleok uses the grappling hook to create a slingshot and fire the boss's projectiles back at itself. In all honesty, I prefer these bosses over the Wind Waker ones. Not that those bosses are bad, it's just some more of the same Zelda mechanics that we've seen before. Shoot the hands, cut the strings, throw the boss into a wall and make it explode into tiny mini bosses. Wait, what? Point being, that while some of Phantom Hourglass's mechanics can be seen as restricting, I think there's a lot more of the mechanics that actually enhance the gameplay in ways other Zelda games couldn't. The side quests have their fair share of interesting things to offer as well. There's the standard Zelda collectible like heart pieces, but there's also a few new additions. Throughout the game, you will find new fairy companions, the spirits of power, wisdom, and courage. The player can switch between these fairies, and that will give Link different abilities. The spirit of power gives you a flaming sword that does twice the damage. The spirit of wisdom makes Link less vulnerable to attacks. And the spirit of courage allows Link to shoot shockwaves from his sword. I loved switching between these abilities depending on which challenge the game was throwing at me. Personally, the Spirit of Wisdom was my favourite to use. If the player collects Force Gems, of which there are 60, they can upgrade these abilities and make Link more powerful. Other collectibles include treasures to find, and the dreaded golden chip parts. The golden chip parts annoy me as the placements of finding them are completely randomised. Sometimes Beedle will sell them for a ridiculously high price, sometimes you can find them in chests, you can even win them by scoring high in the minigames. The game doesn't keep track of which golden chip parts you already have, so there's a good chance you'll get duplicates. I've never been able to get all the golden chip parts during any of my playthroughs, as a randomization really killed my motivation and patience to find them all. Why couldn't these things just be hidden in specific places in the overworld? The heart pieces, or in this game's case, heart containers, have some really interesting side quests related to them. There's this really quirky side quest early in the game that involves a fisherman who really wants to find a mermaid. What the player finds is not a mermaid, but rather a woman in a costume who just wants the attention of being listened to, and respected by someone. Once the two of them are together, they form an odd but interesting relationship with one another. This will unlock the fishing rod, which a player can use to get a heart piece if they find a certain fish in the overworld. Another quest involves the player hitting a character with their sword 100 times before the character can hit them 3 times, similar to the side quest in Wind Waker. There's a maze island in which the player has to navigate a labyrinth under the time limit and reach a heart container. Two of the heart containers can be brought from shops, and that's it. That's all the heart containers the game has to offer. I certainly hope there's not this really frustrating heart container that makes me lose my sanity the moment I enter the area. What is it with Zelda games, and their impossibly hard shooting gallery games? Why do they feel the need to do this? The targets move way too fast, you can't miss any of them or you'll lose your combo, there are other targets in the way that will make you lose points, you only have 70 seconds to get the heart container, then you need to get at least 2500 points. What's the closest I've ever gotten? 1700. I wholeheartedly hate this minigame, and I hate the fact that there's a heart piece tied to it. It's without a doubt one of the hardest heart containers to get in the entire series. Yes, that means it's even harder than Majora's Shooting Gallery Heartbeats. Whenever I replay the game, I skip this minigame entirely. It just simply isn't worth it, no matter how painful it is to have that one heart missing from the top of my screen. <sighs> With all the game controls, mechanics, and collectibles covered, let's finally address the glaring elephant in the room. The Temple of Ocean King. Whenever I see a negative review of this game, it's the number one thing that gets pointed out. The Temple of Ocean King is terrible. There's too much repeated content. These phantoms are annoying. I hate this time mechanic. I understand the criticisms. I really do. It is annoying how often you have to repeat floors to get back to where you were, and there's no real reason as to why the game can't make checkpoints for every time you have to return here. And the repeated content is the main reason this place is hated by most players. The concept of the temple is that unless you're standing in the safe areas, your health will drain as you manoeuvre through it. When the player acquires the Phantom Hourglass early in the game, then they will not lose health, as long as there's sand in the timer. The player has a limited amount of time to complete a segment. Defeating a boss from a dungeon adds two minutes onto the timer, and there's some extra time you can gain from doing some side quests in the overworld. While in the temple, you have to avoid the patrolling phantoms. If a player is hit by them, they'll lose time and respawn at the beginning of the floor. You as the player have to stealth around the enemy, rather than engage in combat with them. 
Here's the problem. The temple isn't just the one temple in the game that everybody else hates, similar to Ocarina of Time's water temple. Nay, you have to come back to this temple constantly throughout the story, meaning that whenever you return, you have to do the same flaws you've already completed in order to progress further. Interestingly, going through the temple more than once isn't the same experience. Whenever you gain new items from another dungeon, you can get through the previous flaws quicker. It's quite fun in practice to run through the first half of the temple trying to beat your best time. As a speedrunning challenge or a side quest to get more optional content, it's a novel concept. However, it isn't a side quest. The player must repeat flaws in order to progress in the story, and I'd be lying if I said that it wasn't a little annoying. When I play this game, I want all the optional content. That means getting all the force gems, all the heart containers, all the golden ship parts, etc. So whenever I have to do the same flaws over and over again, I'm at least getting something out of it by unlocking the collectibles that I wouldn't get the first time around. If a player just wants to continue the story and doesn't care for the side quests, this is just a massive waste of time for them. It's such a shame because it's such a simple fix. Just have a better checkpoint system for those only interested in the story and have the option to go back to previous floors for the completionists. This mechanic can be tedious, but it wasn't enough to dampen my experience of the game. A lot of the negative reviews tend to use the Temple of Ocean King as a smoking gun to show that this game is terrible, but the temple itself is quite interesting. Each level introduces a new mechanic, like the sound flaws that will alert the phantoms if you run too fast. The only puzzle that really got on my nerves was this one of the shaped gems. Any completionists who've done this section will likely know what I'm talking about. Alright, so this is where things get fairly confusing. You want to go off to the right and there is a round pedestal, so place the round crystal there. This lowers the spikes temporarily as long as the crystal is there, um, and then you can step on this floor switch to make a permanent way to get past this wall. So you don't even need the round crystal in that switch anymore. However, leave it there. Super important, I will explain why in a little while. Placing the triangle crystal in the pedestal will lower the spikes just below us, which gains us access to this crystal switch, which will open the door to the top right. So we're going to do that, and we're going to head there in just a little bit. Now, when you place the triangle crystal and the round crystal are in their pedestals at the same time, this will create a chest off to the left up in, on this invisible platform, so we can walk out onto that. Without this walkthrough, I wouldn't have figured out this at all, and the game doesn't make it clear. Overall, the controls are a learning curve for some, but I didn't have that problem for the most part. In my opinion, the way this game plays isn't as nearly as limiting as Skyward Sword's motion controls or Spirit Track's musical segments. It introduces a new way of playing that isn't intrusive. Zelda music is iconic, and one of the main factors I consider when I rank an entry to the series. Say what you want about Skyward Sword, the soundtrack slaps. Unfortunately, Phantom Hourglass doesn't fare too well on this side. It's not that the soundtracks are necessarily bad, it's just that there's not enough of them. Perhaps the DS Lite didn't have enough storage to have a large variety of soundtracks, but it does hinder the overall experience of the game as a whole. Take Merkay Island's theme. This is the first isle you explore in the game. To me, this music represents new beginnings and instantly sets the tone for the game. There aren't many drum and bass instruments, which makes the track sound very basic and childlike. This makes sense narratively and gameplay wise, as the Link is adjusting to this new world and the player is starting off on the easiest difficulty. No matter what happens to your adventure, you can always return to the comforts of Merkay Island. At least that would be the case until you visit Melinda Island, or the Isle of Frost. Or Harrier Island. You starting to notice a pattern? It's frustrating because the reuse of music doesn't just appear on the islands. Every dungeon theme is the same, every boss theme is the same, every enemy encounter is the same. Because of this, it almost feels as if you aren't progressing at all, because everywhere you go sounds the same. 
It makes it difficult for each island and dungeon to have its own personality when everything just sounds like When I mentioned that I wasn't a fan of Wind Waker's bosses, they do have their own unique theme that gives them personality. The final boss even had a different theme for each phase of the fight. I find that out of all of the boss's themes, this one invokes a feeling of pressure and stress. This desperation and panic gives this tune a sharp contrast to the previous boss themes, which conveyed a feeling of triumph and victory. There's a level of fear and dread looming over these tracks, but I don't think the music is reflective of Link's thoughts, rather, Ganon's. In context, it would make sense that Ganon would be stressed during this fight. He's come so far at this point, and failing now would make everything fall apart. Since Ocarina of Time's events 100 years ago, Ganon has been sealed away in the Sacred Realm, having only recently escaped. He knows he cannot underestimate Link like he did last time. As much as he wants to take vengeance on the next hero in the cycle, he knows that he must hold back his power in order to succeed. So, like a coward, instead of facing Link head on, he creates a puppet for him to fight. The theme builds dramatically during the intense opening cutscene where we can hear Ganon's bones snapping and twisting to create this monstrous new form. The first phase uses slow distorted instruments in its track, and the pitch is constantly shifting from high to low. This could represent the strings on the puppet trying to keep itself up. It starts and stops like a military drill. The second track ups the intensity. Trumpets are introduced to the song to give the theme a more triumphant tone, but something about this part seems off. The percussion instruments sound like they're taking short, panic breaths whilst playing. The suddenness of this part of the song usually plays when a spider is about to drop. As frustrating as Snake Ganon is to fight, his theme is the most intense track of the three. You can hear the desperation in this song as the player is nearing victory. Harp instruments are introduced near the end of the track. These instruments I feel are representing the goddesses cheering on the player as it comes to a close. This ending theme battle is so epic and bursting with identity. The other boss tracks in Wind Waker are also great. Goma, being the first boss you face, leaves a daunting impression on the player. Hearing that suddenness of the first few notes really grabs the player's attention, and the notes rising and falling builds the adrenaline. Then you have bosses like Godin, which give off a completely different vibe. Instead of this boss being a life-threatening enemy, it's a challenge set by the goddesses, a puzzle. Even gameplay-wise, the boss's presence is less of an adrenaline rush and more of an obstacle. If you run out of arrows, the boss will simply supply you with more. This makes sense story-wise, as I'd imagine the goddesses would want the trial to be fair. The church organ represents a divine presence looming over you, and the melody is confused and robotic sounding. This is just covering the boss themes. I haven't even mentioned the epicness of Dragon Roost style, the opening title theme, or the Great Sea, which are incredible standalone tracks and all-time favourites for many fans. While the songs in Wind Waker may be better overall, it doesn't mean that Phantom Hourglass's soundtrack is bad, it just has less variety. The characters have their own light motifs and themes, and some classic Wind Waker tracks even make an appearance here. Linebeck's theme is probably where the game peaks in terms of music, but we'll get onto that later as it's more story related. Oshis's theme is also very well done. Being the Lost Ocean King, there's a sense of sadness felt in this track, as if something is missing from this character who was once a mighty being. Now he's just a humble yet wise old man. It always feels as if he knows more than he lets on.
I mentioned earlier that the bosses all have the same theme, but there's one exception, the final boss, a demonic entity known as Bellum. It has such a strange and uneasy sounding tune in his battle. As the main antagonist, Bellum certainly stands out from the other Zelda villains as a whole. Ganondorf, Girahim, and Zant, for example, all have unique personalities. Their interactions with Link throughout the story explains their motivations and what led them to going down this path of hatred. <coughs> Villains with no motive, or at least no explanations of their motives, can still manage to intimidate the player if executed well. We never really found out why Majora wanted to bring down the moon. There are a few lines of dialogue from them in the game that roughly translates to... because I can. Majora proves throughout the whole game just how dangerous they are and what's at stake if Link fails. Bellum is a similar villain in this respect, as it has no dialogue, no body language, no facial expressions, nothing that would make it even remotely human or relatable. It's this strange alien-like creature with no remorse or empathy, it just wants to feed, to destroy. The strange music in this boss fight really conveys the feeling of an unknown threat. You don't know what it is, you just know that's dangerous. Not only is Tetra's life in danger, but there's nothing to say that Bellum won't stop draining the life from the ocean if you fail. That moment where Bellum possesses Linebeck to make you fight him, and then Linebeck's theme is incorporated into the music gave me chills. I really don't think that Phantom Hourglass has a bad soundtrack at all. A controversial opinion of mine is that I think the great sea theme in this game is better than Wind Waker's. I can't put into words as to why it is. This version just has more of a melody that I could play on loop for hours. One thing that I do wish was improved, and this goes for most Zelda titles, is that I wish these songs were orchestrated rather than artificially made. Take a look at what a difference it makes. While that would sound nice, I can't really criticise the game for it. They likely didn't have the budget or storage on the DS to pull this off. Perhaps it would be nice to see in a remake of the game. That's wishful thinking of course, because Nintendo won't even remake the game's fans want remade <laughs> Twilight Princess on Switch. With that said, I think it's time to finally dive into the heart of the game and dissect its story. With Phantom Hourglass being a direct sequel to Wind Waker, I'll start by summing up the first game's story. Wind Waker takes place a hundred years after Ocarina of Time's events, in which Zelda sent Link back in time to relive his childhood, but in doing this, she split the timeline into two. In the timeline where Link is sent back to his child self, he was able to warn Zelda about the danger of opening the door of time, preventing that game's events entirely. He then went on a journey to find Navi, which leads to Majora's Mask and eventually Twilight Princess's events. But what about the timeline with adult Zelda? She sent Link away to another timeline leaving her to live alone in the ruins of Hyrule with Ganon sealed away. With there no longer being a hero in Hyrule, Ganon broke free from the Sacred Realm and cast the world into shadow. Things got so out of hand, the goddesses had to intervene and drown Hyrule forever. That's right all of Hyrule and its history beneath the waves, and that brings us to Wind Waker. The next generation of Hyruleans live on small islands far away from each other. It is here that we meet our favourite main character in green. Right away, the game just throws away the whole chosen one narrative out the window. The cycle has been broken, and with the hero of time gone, he has no descendants to continue his legacy. Instead of this game's Link being a chosen hero, he's just a regular kid. He wasn't chosen by the gods, he has no connection to the hero of time, this Link is just like any other Hylian living on the peaceful island called Outset. 
The only reason he dons a green tunic at all is because it's an old tradition Elsit has to honour the Hero of Time, a tradition that this Link clearly doesn't want to be a part of. To him, the legend of the previous hero is just that, a legend. Why should he have to pick up the pieces that the previous generation broke? My interpretation of the game is that his story focuses on a lost history and tradition. When an old world is lost, what pieces of it should be revived? Should everything be tossed away for the sake of starting a new generation? Or should we honour the old ways as a valued part of history? What do you do when you can't move on from the past? How do you cope with living up to a legacy you know nothing of? Hyrule has been under the waves for many years, while Outset Island used to have a tradition where boys would be sent to fight when they come of the same age as the Hero of Time, that tradition has since faded over the years. Only one of the village elders knows about sword fighting, and the rest of them seem content with the new age of living, even Link. Had adventure not been forced upon him, he likely would have lived a peaceful life on Outset, unaware of the looming dangers hidden amongst the sea. And forced into it he was. Not long into the game, Link's sister has been kidnapped by a giant bird, and he sets out to sea to go looking for her. Before this game, Link has never had such a personal attachment to a character he's had to save. In most games, saving Zelda is just what he's expected to do as a hero. Here, the player has the motivation to save Link's sister, because they can see just how big of an effect the loss had on him. After completing the Forsaken Fortress, a very unique dungeon by Zelda Sanders, Link finds his sister only to be immediately thrown out by that same giant bird that kidnapped her. It is here that we can see the first glimpse of this game's Ganondorf, and... <coughs> here we go with the classic villain gets rid of main character without checking if they're dead trope. Why don't you just kill him? No, Scott, I have an even better idea. I'm going to place him in an easily escapable situation involving an overly elaborate and exotic death. Why doesn't Ganon just kill Link here? I'm aware that he likely thinks a hero of time doesn't have any descendants because, you know, he's dead. But he's not even going to check? We find out later that the reason he's kidnapping all these girls is because he's trying to find the next Zelda in a cycle, so why not check if this kid who looks like the hero of time has any connection to the Triforce? Considering this is the same Ganon from Ocarina of Time, who lost specifically because he underestimated Link, you'd think that he'd not want to take any more chances. With that scene aside, Link is thrown into the ocean and saved by this game's companion, the King of Red Lions. He's a boat that talks. You know, as most boats do. But what do I know, right? I'm just a boat. As a companion, the King of Red Lions is a cool character in concept, but for the most part, he lacks an engaging personality. His introduction is quite comical, but for the majority of the game, his dialogue mainly consists of Link, you are destined to complete your destined destiny in which you are destined to fulfil. The advice he gives is mostly useless, and he has a habit of stating the obvious. Oh Link, you should probably avoid that life-threatening cyclone in the future. Really? I hate you both. From this point on, the game fully starts, and the player is free to explore the world and complete the story. As open-world Zelda's go, this game has a great setting. I love discovering new islands and finding hidden secrets throughout the sea. There's a great mix of story and gameplay implemented here. While you can explore the whole ocean after beating the first dungeon, there are some islands that are inaccessible if you don't have the right items. This mechanic may seem restrictive in comparison to Breath of the Wild, where you can explore anything at any time, but personally I like it quite a lot. Whenever I reach an island I couldn't access, it helps shift my focus back to the main story after getting sidetracked. While there aren't a lot of dungeons in the game, the amount of side quests almost makes up for it. Almost. As for the rest of the story, it's fairly basic, but what really sells this game for me is that feeling of awe and adventure. The ending of the game is also quite the highlight. Not only do you have an awesome boss fight, minus Nick Ganon, I hate that phase, you also have a really well written Ganondorf here. No longer is he just some generic obstacle to defeat, he explains his motivations in a way where you can almost see what shaped him into this power hungry monster. During this ending cutscene, he explains just how harsh the Gerudo Desert has suffered over the years, how his people have died from starvation and famine. Hyrule was his key to a better life, for him and his followers, but he got too attached to the concept of overtaking the land, even after it was buried beneath the waves. No one lives here, no one could survive here. Ultimately, what would he gain from seizing control of this underwater land? Well, I think Ganon knows this, but he simply doesn't care. He's too far gone. With the Triforce within his reach, he goes to seize his power only to be stopped by King Daphnes, who is revealed to be the long-lost King of Hyrule. 
Although the king admits that he, like Ganondorf, is too attached to this world, he makes one last wish upon the Triforce. He asks for nothing but for Link and Zelda to return to the mainland. They are the younger generation that will create Hyrule anew and move forward. Link and Zelda beg the king to come with them, but he refuses. Zelda promises to find a new Hyrule, to which the king responds, Ah, but child, that land will not be Hyrule. It will be your land. And with those final words, the king drowns with the rest of this long lost world, leaving Link and Zelda to find a new land for a new life. So how does Phantom Hourglass follow up on this ending? That's the neat part, it doesn't. Phantom Hourglass plays more like a spin-off or epilogue rather than a direct sequel, and I personally think it works quite well. The game is running on a weaker console with a tighter budget, so it makes sense to tackle a less action-heavy plot and focus on something more character-based. We start, as most Zelda games do, with Link sleeping on the job. The crew is sailing for a new land, but rumors of a haunted ship unsettles them. Tetra, the ship's captain, is convinced that the so-called ghost ship is just some horror story, but the other crew members aren't buying it. Everything comes to a halt when a sinister ship emerges from the distant fog. A gloomy vessel bearing a skull at its bow approaches, and everybody silences in its presence. Tetra, still not convinced that the legend is real, boards the ship without hesitation. So, this game's motivation is to save Tetra. Of course, when I first played this game, I hadn't played Wind Waker and had no idea who Tetra was. Looking at this premise in hindsight, now that I've played it, I'm a little torn on the storyline. I'll be honest, Tetra's cutthroat personality is a little over the top, even for a Zelda game. I get what they were going for, that she's a no-nonsense pirate who doesn't want to show her more compassionate side to anyone. Midna is another example of a cutthroat companion, but at least in that game we know that she's literally using Link to get her own way. And we see her character arc grow throughout the course of the game. In Tetra's case, she's practically responsible for Link's sister being kidnapped, as revealed by this character. All I mean to say is that if you big bad pirates hadn't come to this quiet little island, that poor girl wouldn't have been snatched away by that bird. And just what do you mean by that? My point is that the bird mistook that poor girl for you and that's why it grabbed her. Her character arc, if you can even call it that, revolves around the Triforce of Wisdom. Once the king reveals to her that she's the Princess Zelda, her character does a complete 180. I understand that she's in shock, but we never see her grow from this revelation because the game decides to remove her from the story almost entirely. Until the final act, she remains sealed in this chamber. Why? Ganon will be searching frantically for the child in order to get the power of the gods that she possesses. Okay, but wouldn't Link be equally in danger of that? You know, since he's proved himself worthy to carry the Triforce of Courage? Tetra has clearly been shown to be a capable fighter, so why can't she accompany Link on his adventure? especially since Ganon ends up finding her in the chamber anyway. I guess it's just against Nintendo lore not to have Zelda be involved in the adventure outside of the final acts. With that said, putting her in danger again for the Phantom Hourglass may seem like a cheap move, but I think the premise is handled quite well. The relationship between Link and Tetra felt far stronger in this game. We see how far Link is willing to go for her and how much the loss affects him. Whenever you open the game during the first act, you see this vision of Tetra calling out for help. I always interpreted this as a nightmare that Link was being haunted by. It's a chilling thought. Now, did Tetra have to be put in danger to show how strong their friendship is? Probably not. But if they were going with this plot, I'd say they did a great job executing it. Compared to Wind Waker, she's a much more tolerable character, and I actually care about saving her as a player. And so, the game begins, and we're greeted to... Oh no! So, we have another fairy companion in this game. 
Her name is Hiella, and she's not as nearly as annoying as Navi. She rarely interrupts your gameplay, and she's actually quite helpful in giving advice, unlike some other companions. Contrasted to Navi, she actually has a personality, and makes a lot of cheeky comments throughout the game. She's probably one of my favourite fairy companions in the series, even though she's not got much competition. I genuinely find her interesting and likeable. She introduces Link to her grandfather, Oshis, who informs him to stay away from the ghost ship at all costs. Link, of course, refuses this and sets out on an adventure despite this old man's warning. After acquiring the sword, the player is given a short tutorial which, I'll admit, narratively wise, makes no sense. This is the same Link from Wind Waker, right? Uh, he knows how to use a sword. I can suspend my disbelief as this game has a different control system, but if Oshis had just acknowledged that Link is a capable fighter already, it may have worked better. He could have said something along the lines of, The enemies are different to what you know, so you need to be prepared. Minor nitpick, really. I've just always found it a little odd. Now that Oshis trusts Link to handle a sword, Ciela suggests that they look for Linebeck, who is a legendary sailor, and the best character in the game. She figures he'd lend us a hand as he owns a ship. We find him trapped in the Temple of Ocean King, begging for help as he's brained his ankle. However, as soon as the player releases him, he runs across the room effortlessly, like a rabbit, as Ciela puts it. This immediately raises the player's suspicions about this character. The music that plays during this interaction also gives off an interesting tone. The way the music is played almost sounds like a boss theme out of context. This dramatic track not only suits Linebeck's vain personality, but also gives the player bad expectations that are ultimately subverted. Linebeck is so selfish and narcissistic as a character that as a kid I thought I genuinely made a mistake by freeing him. As narcissistic as he is, he's not unlikable or annoying to watch. It's like what they were trying to do with Tetra, but better. He acts more like comic relief, giving moments of levity during dramatic moments. He even directly affects the story during the climax by joining the fight. I really like the back and forth rebuttal he has with Ciela. I don't think there's another Zelda game that constantly has two companions bickering at each other. Both of these characters are great on their own, but put them together and it's just comedic gold. These two beat the King of Red Lions as a companion in my book any day. Link convinces Linebeck to let him ride on the ship in exchange for any treasure that can be found on the journey. Once we have our lead to the next destination, we set out to the ocean and head for the first dungeon. As goes typical Zelda formula, we complete three basic dungeons and then a major story event triggers. In this game's case, now that we've found the three spirits, we can search for the ghost ship. To do this, the player must sail through the thick fog. The spirits light up when the ship is close and they're all you can navigate with as the dramatic music swells in the background. The tension that builds in this moment is so well done and is honestly one of the coolest parts in the entire game. Unlike the previous game, the ghost ship is a looming threat. I remember playing Wind Waker and hearing about the ghost ship through various NPCs. It sounded so mysterious and ominous, especially since it can only appear on certain nights. However, when you get to the ghost ship, it's nothing special. It looks like every other ship in the game, but now has a filter. Here in Phantom Hourglass there's actually a deep lore behind the ship that the game doesn't give away too much at the same time. Most of it is left up to interpretation which I think is for the best. The dungeon isn't too special, but I like the overall design of the place. All the creaky floorboards and thick purple fog really sets the atmosphere and there are some genuine tense moments here and there. During the dungeon you'll have to free these four sisters who claim to be prisoners alongside Tetra. It's fairly obvious that these sisters are up to no good as they're constantly laughing under their breath leading enemies towards Link, and putting themselves in harm's way at every turn. The bug like I should have given away the fact that they're all evil, but as a kid this completely went over my head for some reason. Once we have the boss key, the sisters turn into their true demonic forms, which leads into an interesting boss battle. Each sister ranks up in difficulty depending on their age. For example, the elder sister is the strongest. While they're quite tough as individuals, they don't quite work well as a unit, this further dehumanises them as they don't have a familial relationship at all, they really are just demons in disguise. Because of this flaw in their dynamic, you can trick one sister into harming another, destroying them one by one. With them finally defeated, Link goes into the heart of the ghost ship only to find... Oh, maybe we were too late. As a kid, this part of the game genuinely shook me, and I honestly thought it was just going to end here on a sombre note, but no. Oshis arrives at the scene, seemingly out of nowhere. 
he reveals his true identity as the Ocean King. A spirit once fought to protect the ocean is now nothing but a weak old man stripped of his powers. While all hope may seem long gone, Ocius tells Link that Bellum can be defeated with the Phantom Sword. Though Tetra is in our sight, we must adventure longer to reunite. Linebeck isn't too pleased to find out there's no treasure aboard the ship, and gives up right then and there. Ocius promises him that should he aid Link in his quest, he'll grant him one wish. Gotta love this guy. So our quest for the next three dungeons is to gather the three metals we can use to forge the Phantom Sword. From this point on, the dungeons are nothing short of phenomenal. They are all engaging, they all have unique, fun mechanics, and they all have fairly interesting quests leading up to them. The last one overstays its welcome a little, but outside of that, I have no real criticisms. Overall, I actually prefer these dungeons over Wind Wakers for the most part. Wind Waker may have better theming and music, but I prefer the puzzles in Phantom Hourglass. The first three aren't too special, but I genuinely had a better time exploring the Temple of Ice than I ever did in the Earth Temple. Why didn't they fix this in a HD version? With those dungeons completed, it's time to make a final trip to the Temple of Ocean King. Now that we have the Phantom Sword, we can finally defeat those annoying phantoms we spent all the game avoiding. Time to head to the final boss. I spoke about Bellum as a villain character earlier in the video. Aesthetically, he's great. The boss moves in mostly unpredictable patterns, and the fight takes place on a set of stairs. You as the player have to keep up with him as he ascends further upwards. I'll admit that the fight itself isn't too challenging, but the ability to pause time does make it interesting. At least it would make it interesting if it was easier to trigger, but I digress. The next part of the battle takes place on the ocean. Thankfully, if you die here, you can return to this phase of the fight without going through the Temple of Ocean King again. With the boss defeated, the curse on Tetra is finally lifted. Of course it wouldn't be that easy. But, in a surprising moment, Linebeck breaks out of his cowardly tendencies and draws the Phantom Sword towards Bellum. He gets possessed, leaving Link to fight him in the last phase. It's quite a unique boss fight, and reminds me of a little of Puppet Zelda from Twilight Princess. There's something chilling about the thought of having to fight a friend like this. Now that the battle is over, for real this time, Tetra and Link can finally reunite and the Ocean King has returned to his all-powerful form. He's a whale fish. As promised, Ocius grants Linebeck one wish. He wishes for nothing but to have his ship back. With that, he leaves Link and Ciela in a rather touching goodbye scene. Link and Tetra are brought back onto the ship we started on at the beginning of the game. It's revealed that time has only passed for two minutes during the game's runtime. This leaves the player wondering if what happened was real. As the music swells in the background, Link looks to the sea to find Linebeck, still sailing the ocean alongside him. The theme that plays during the credits is such a great mix of adventure and solace. Those two words really sum up this adventure as a whole for me. It's not the biggest adventure we've seen Link on, nor is it the most nuanced, but it is a fun ride. At least I found it to be. Was this a bad game? Absolutely not. It has its flaws, and its adventure may not be as grand in scope compared to other titles, but I really don't think it needed to be. It may be very different to other titles, but one of the reasons I love Zelda so much is because it can adapt and change with the times. Each game has their own unique look and feel, but every single one of them stays true to the theme of the series. Assassin's Creed is another series I love, but I would admit that most of the games play exactly the same from one another. Brotherhood and 2 are practically the same game but with different stories. Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask are direct sequels that use the same assets and character models, and yet they still manage to feel like completely different experiences. Every adventure is memorable no matter how big or small it may be. Whether you as the player have saved the world, or just one life, the experience can make you feel like you've truly achieved something great, something powerful. Going from farmer to warrior, a train engineer to soldier, or simply a young child discovering his true origins, 
These moments of growth are symbolised everywhere throughout the franchise, and shows that destiny doesn't have to be written in fate, you can choose it for yourself. Link doesn't overcome his struggles because he's the most powerful, but simply because he's the most determined. Phantom Hourglass may not be as epic as Ocarina, or as story heavy as Twilight, but it's an adventure well worth taking. And when one of the weaker Zelda games still has an amazing element within, that's when you know you have a good series. Though that decision doesn't really seem to make sense. Oh wait, huh? <laughs> Why said doesn't seem to make sense. It's quite remarkable how seamless. It's the A now. I'll be honest. No. <laughs> Min. The Helmer Rock King was of. Gr uh, wait, huh? What the player finds is that it's not a mermaid, but rather a woman in a costume. Arr, you bugger, you bugger. While in the temple, you have to avoid the patrolling uh, Ganondorf, Girahim, and the Zant, for example. Uh, add me. <laughs> Bellum is a similar villain in this respect, as it has no dialogue, no body language. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking of the music. Like, no dick, no balls, and probably no butthole since this guy feeds on radiation. Hyrule was. Uh, how his people have died from starvation and. Uh, during this ending cutscene, he explains just how harsh the Gerudo. During this time, oh the fuck, fish orgy. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. I always interpreted this as a nightmare. Oh. F Contrasted to Navi, she actually has a cur. Oh. Here in Phantom Hourglass, there's actually a deep. Oh. Here in Phantom. Oh no! What the hell? Here in Phantom Hourglass, there's actually a deep floor that a ship. What? <laughs> that are all. Oh, fuck. OSHA's promises. There. And yet they still manage to look like. Oh, what the hell? Going from farmer to warrior, a train engineer to soldier, or are you. Oh, fuck. This is the same link from Wind Waker, right? Oh, I've, I'm just. Now. This is epic. 